talking about uh, a roadmap for fast and efficient genome analysis. And before that, let me introduce our research group. So we are called Safari Research Group. We have uh, quite a large number of members with PhD students, postdocs, masters, and interns. And this is our motto, Think Big, Aim High. And we are currently located in Switzerland, in the beautiful city of Zurich. This is the city center, and this is ETH. And we are part of the uh, Department of Computer Science. And the, our Safari Research Group is led by Professor Anur Mutlu, who was a professor at CMU for about uh, six to seven years, and he joined ETH in September 2015. And our research uh, spans um, many directions, many research areas, starting from computer architecture to hardware software uh, cooperation, hardware security, and bioinformatics. And we are currently hiring students at all levels, postdoc, PhD, masters. So please feel free, feel free to apply to our group and spread the news among all the colleagues. So this is a personal story. Uh, we used to receive these packages in Gaza City, where I got my school education and bachelor degree. And we received these packages through JICA. And these packages, we received some personal photos, some motivation letters, some really um, great things that uh, those packages are normally awarded to the first uh, or the best two or three students in each class for uh, Palestinian schools. And these things really um, touch our heart. So I would like to thank all Japanese people for supporting education in my country. Thank you so much. Do you still have connection with this family? Uh, we don't know who are this family, so okay. I received this picture myself 15 years ago. So probably this little kid here, the oh, young yeah. man now in the university. So please, if you know this family, thank them very much. <laughs> it's been a very long time. And I think this uh, thing is already continuing until today. So I'm very proud of this, actually. And I'm keeping all these packages I received during my school education in my parent's house in Gaza. OK. So now we'll start the, the talk, and this actually lecture is not about how we analyze genome analysis in wet lab. So it's more related to computer science, how to develop algorithms, how to do hardware architecture that can accelerate or provide some benefits to genome analysis. And I will be talking why we pick genome analysis as a problem, and why we need to accelerate. What's the importance of this problem? And what is genome analysis? Then I will show you the need for Map, remapping, and I will tell you later what is read and how we map it. And then I will jump in the algorithms and the hardware architecture that we developed for genome analysis problem. And at the end, I will show you some future opportunities for accelerating genome analysis. So, okay, why we should bother ourselves about genome analysis? So this Japanese term, which means uh, difficult illness, and this is actually a correct uh, term to refer to the rare disease. And this term is coined by the Japanese Ministry of Labor, Health, and Welfare in 1972. And as a word, we have 1 in 17 expected to have a rare disease at a certain time in their life. And that is translated into numbers to 350 million people. And 75 of these people are children. And 30% of these children never make it to their fifth birthday. And 80% of these people having a rare disease caused by a genetic disorder. So that shows you the importance of having a personalized medicine that could address this rare disease that we don't know how to, um, how to cure them or we, we, it's really difficult to have sufficient time to address this problem or cure these diseases. So in Japan in specific, uh, Professor Matsuda from Koyoto University, he said, we don't know exactly how many people in Japan have a rare disease. But you can think about it, out of 20 of your friends, one of them will have a rare disease. So that's why Japan started an initiative on rare and undiagnosed diseases, uh, where they spend around 600 to 700 million uh, Japanese yen a year to sequence around 2,000 uh, patients with rare disease in Japan every year. 
So you can think that, that already Japan realized this, not now, but already since very long time. And in the UK, for example, this year, they start to offer um, whole genome sequencing, meaning that they start reading the full genome of critically sick children in the hospitals. And by doing that, they already know that, okay, this rare disease from the symptoms or from the phenotypes, we couldn't know what disease they have, but from their, from their genome, we could decide on personalized medicine. And that saved the cost by $100,000 to $300,000 per patient. So think about this, if we apply the same method in Japan or other countries, we could save really the inpatient cost by a lot. And we could invest this cost by sequencing more genomes of Japanese people, not necessarily to be unhealthy. They could be healthy so that we can protect them in the future, for example. Okay, so this is an example of high blood pressure, for example. And each line here, you can see, uh, it's a portion of individual genome. And this, um, for example, this is the blood pressure. And whenever it's high, you can check which part of the genome is correlated to the high blood pressure, for example. And because you are smart people, you can think about, like, okay, SNP2 sounds like more random values. It's not correlated with the high blood pressure. But for SNP1, for example, whenever C here, you can observe a high blood pressure. So we can think from this example, does it always necessarily to have one character difference in our genome that causes the disease? The answer, no. So in this example, there are an alteration or a difference of 500,000 characters in the genome. And that causes these diseases. If we delete this amount from our genome in a specific portion, for example, chromosome 16, you observe one of these two diseases. Mm -hmm. However, if we duplicate it, or if you observe a duplication of this amount in chromosome 16 in the same place of this, you will observe the opposite disease. For example, obesity will get underweight. So we are talking here about very challenging problems, not about single character variations. Could be very large variations. We can think about another example showing the importance of analyzing our genome. For example, city scale microbiome profiling, where you have very crowded places, such as Tokyo subway stations or New York subway stations. And for that purpose, there are study conducted in 2015 where they analyzed about 1,500 samples from New York City subways. So you can think about everything in this station. They swap the, the card machines, the train doors, the train seats, and so on. And they record the GPS coordination, coordination of these um, coordinates of this um, location that they collect the samples. And from these 1,500 samples, they did some microbiotic analysis using some specific tools. And from these tools, they infer that these samples having around 50% of bacteria and other 50% unknown species. They don't know what they are species before. They don't have it in their database. And the most interesting thing about this study that they have uh, black, black in, 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 in these samples, and this is a very dangerous disease caused by Yersinia pistis uh, bacteria. And for those who, uh, who don't know this disease, so this in the 14th century caused uh, one third death of one third of the population of Europe within a few years. So this is very dangerous to find it in a place such as a New York subway station. However, this um, raised a lot of alarm and attention in the media in the US and they were thinking to shut down this uh, station until they investigated uh, further and they, they searched whether we really have Yersinia pistis uh, bacteria there or not. But this was a false alarm. This was a false positive. When they investigated using traditional method, it wasn't there. And some people calling this case a failure of bioinformatics. And I really don't agree with this as because the tool they are using it wasn't accurate. So for that, if we have an accurate tool that can analyze these samples, so we couldn't get uh, these false positives, for example. And that shows you the critical need, not only for fast tools, but also for accurate. We don't want to mess with the result of this uh, analysis. OK, so now we show you the importance of having uh, fast and uh, accurate genome analysis. Now, what is genome analysis, actually? 
So simply, genome analysis, you want to get a, a genetic sample from your body, from animal, from plants, from soil, from any place, and you want to get the full text that's showing all the characters of your DNA in the text format. This is a chemical format, you can't analyze it using computer algorithms. So by having the full text of your DNA, then you can infer some differences by comparing this DNA to another DNA of healthy people or some other species. However, unfortunately, we don't have any machine or method that can provide you the full content of your genome. We don't have it. Okay, so what are we talking about here? How long is our DNA? How, what is the workload, basically, for your computer algorithm? So if we are talking about viruses, it's few kilo characters, few thousand characters. If we are talking about bacteria, then it's few million. And if we are talking, uh, talking about the human genome, then it's few billion characters. Do we think we are the best on Earth? Do we have the longest DNA? No. So red onion, for example, has around 5x more or longer DNA. And this Japanese flower has about uh, 15x a longer DNA than our human genome. So it's really complicated to analyze this, for example, using your personal computer or design an algorithm that can handle this workload. Okay, and when we want to check the similarity between species, so if we are comparing a human to human, then we need to be sensitive to 0.1% of differences. However, if you miss with this analysis, then you may end up showing a human is as a banana because we have some similarity with it. So you have to be careful about designing an accurate algorithm to analyze our genome. And we, we, could, we could be able to crack our first draft of our human uh, sequence in 2003 and later on we got more updated version of this uh, human genome. However, it was very expensive at, time, at that time and to get the 3 billion character of our sequence, it took us 13 years to get the sequence. And it cost us around $3 billion. And this project was a collaboration between Japan, UK, US, and many other countries. So think about how expensive it was previously, before 20 years. However, in these days, we are doing really good. We can sequence our genomes much better. So we are able to get 1,000x longer DNA or longer uh, number of bases within only 44 hours and less than $1,000. However, these machines these days still do not give you the full content of your genome. What they provide only short pieces, short segment of your DNA. It could be short, it could be long, but they don't provide the full content of your DNA. And that um, create another problem which I'm going to talk about. And these are the sequencing machine where you give it a blood sample and give you the, the text that you want to analyze. And it could be as hand size or something very small that you can attach to your iPhone, or it could be a room size or fridge size, for example. We have too many models, too many companies, properties. They, they differ in the read length, the, the, the length of the piece of your DNA, and the sequencing error. So these, uh, these machines are not perfect they introduce their own error in the sequence. So sometimes you don't really know at this location if it was A or C or G or T. Okay, and these pieces produced by this machine, they don't have any information about their order or the location. How we should stick these pieces together such that we get the full content of our genome. We don't have such information. So you, do, you need to infer it yourself. Okay, so these are two different uh, type of pieces that we can get out of this machine. It could be really very small, it could be very long. This is um, this, an example, just a picture of a uh, phase that explains um, uh, the short and the long. However, uh, which one is better, do you think? To get short pieces or long pieces? Okay, so both of them are still used. There is no better here because for each one you need to pay certain cost. For the short one, they are very short, around 300 characters, but they are very accurate. So the sequencing machine are able to reduce these strengths in high accuracy, so you can trust them somehow. But the long one, they are easier for you because they represent a large portion of your DNA, 
but they have a 15% sequencing error. So sometimes you can't trust it, and that's why you need a lot of them. We call it a high coverage, such that you overlap them and then try to correct some of these errors. So though they are long, but they, they don't make the problem easier because they introduce a large number of errors. Okay, now if we got those bunch of reads, we call them reads, which are the pieces coming from your DNA, and you have the genetic sample, you send it to the machine, you got those pieces. Now you want to build back your DNA in a text format. So what you do, you already have the reference genome that we built in 2003 or any later updated version and we got the first piece, for example, from those uh, reads and we try at all locations, we said, okay, does it, is it similar at this location? Is it similar here? Is it similar there? And we keep doing this for all these pieces. We stick them to the, our reference genome until we get the very smooth, nice text of our DNA. However, if we are analyzing a metagenomic sample where we go to crowded places, we don't expect to have a single species like a human or bacteria or virus. It could be a collection of those. And when we send it to the machine, we got a bunch of these read, but we can't compare it to single reference. We need to have a database of these references. It could be 2,000, could be 20,000. It depends on your target. And then we do exactly the same thing, but at a larger scale. So we compare all of these reads to all of these references and we don't expect to have very nice coverage for single species. So some of these reads, for example, are shared between these references and this, is, has, this problem has its own challenges to address using your computer algorithm. So the reference to genome of human being is from a European guy? Um, so my question is, you know, you said that Hillary Clinton and uh, Donald Trump are different only by 0.1%. Yes. But you don't know if a European and you, like how much they're different, right? Exactly. So that's why we, we use a lot of these reads. So okay. the, we want the overlap. And at the end, we decide whether we should uh, stick ourselves to the reference or we pick the differences coming from your read. And that's why we don't exactly perfectly match each read to the reference. So we allow some differences between them. And later on, I'm going to explain about dynamic programming algorithms, which are um, which allow uh, these uh, differences to be there. They keep the, some deletion, insertions, or substitution between your read and your reference. So you already allow some variation for your copy and the reference copy. Although there are a lot of research showing that using this single reference is not good for some research, because each population should be represented by its own reference. Because this reference can represent Japanese, but not, for example, African. Can represent European, but not African, and so on. So each one, with its own geographical uh, location, should, ha uh, should be represented by separate reference. And I'm going to show you some of this uh, work that showed the importance of sequencing for each country. That's why Japan started its own 100,000 genome sequencing project. UK has the same thing. In the US, we have the same thing. So each country aimed to sequence their own people such that they have a good reference that they can refer to. OK, so now what are the challenges of uh, doing read mapping? So this is the reference. This is the human reference genome, for example. And those are the reads after you stick them to certain location. So you said, OK, this piece, it might be good to stick it at this location because somehow it's similar to this location within certain differences. And how many of those differences? This is a threshold set by you or by informatician. So we stick all of these pieces together and then we do something we call it assembly or we polish these until we build the very nice strain by resolving those overlapping pieces. So we do, we do something like majority voting, for example. If at this vertical level, we have all of them A except one position C. What should we do? Is it A or C? So it depends on your algorithm, you can, you can pick it as A because it's a majority there. Okay, what are the challenges in this scenario? So first of all, you need to report all the mapping location of each read. So if the same read could map here because it has a very nice similarity or very close similarity to this location, and also map here, and also map there, 
you need to report all these locations because you are not really sure whether this read could fit at this location or that or the other location. And the second thing, as I mentioned, when we are looking to a certain disease, we want to study it. What are the differences between this human being and this human being that caused this disease? So we might be looking for very small differences, such as the high blood pressure, or very large portion of differences. So we need to allow these differences between the read and the reference. So when we stick one read here, it's not necessarily exact match here, but we should have some differences between them. And we need to do this process very fast. Why is that? Because sometimes the application could be a life critical, as I show you in the critical sick children hospitalized. So they need an immediate action from doctors, such as personalized medicine. And for that, you need to do this process extremely fast. Okay, now how we do actually do mapping? So a brute force algorithm is just to pick the read and you have the reference and you go linearly scan it at every single location. Does it match here? Does it match here? Does it match here? However, this is very expensive. So the time complexity of such scenario is m quadratic km. m quadratic because we are using this read to compare a certain location with the same position here, same portion of the reference. So we do, uh, we do use dynamic programming algorithm for that. Why is that? Because dynamic programming algorithm allows us to have some differences between them when we compare. And I'm going to show you an example later on. And the K is the number of these pieces. So from the sequencing machine, we could get thousand or million or billion of these pieces. So we are doing this comparison for each read. And we scan for each read the entire reference, which has N long. So how long we keep scanning at each location and each position we are doing dynamic programming and we do this for all these reads. So this is extremely expensive, it's not efficient. So how we address that? We use exactly as we do in yellow pages. So in the old days we used to um, use these books or yellow pages to find the phone number of our colleague or friends for example. So how we uh, look into these uh, yellow pages? We go to the index of the book and we find the family name that starts with alphabet A, for example. Then the index will tell you, go to this page number and then you start looking for that page or that section. Let it be, for example, page X. Then you go to page X and you start looking. Now you already know that all the sections start with alphabet A for the family member. So you go to the second letter and you keep searching all until you get the perfect match with the family member or the family name. And then you continue with the first name until you get a complete match with, with the name, then you retrieve the phone number. And we, we will do exactly the same thing for genome analysis. So how is that? Using three steps. So the first step, we need to have the uh, index of this yellow pages. How we build the index? So we have the reference genome, and what we do, we get the first 12 character, for example, from the reference genome, and we store it somewhere. This piece, we call it a seed or k mark, and k here is the length of this seed, which is 12, for example. And then whenever this piece appears in the same reference genome, we record just the location of that piece. So start at 12 and then at uh, 23, for example and then start with this location and then at uh, 12 characters later. And then we have this location and that location as well. And we keep doing this for all pieces that are, uh, that are recorded in the reference genome. And we record their all, all location as well. And this data structure we call it a hash table, but it's not necessarily to be a hash table. It could be any, any data structure that can accommodate this piece of information. Okay, so now we build the index, so we have the index. Now the good thing about the index is that built only once for each reference. So whenever you are targeting a human genome, you already have this one stored somewhere in your hard drive, so you just retrieve it and use it. You don't rebuild it again. Because it's really expensive to build it again, it can be three minutes, for example, or it can be one hour to build it. Depends on the algorithm you are using, and the size of this index or the hash table for a human genome, the human genome, as I mentioned, is 3 gigabytes, right? But if you want to build the index for it, it can be 4.7 gigabyte or 16.5 gigabyte. This depends on the way you pick the seeds. 
you know, the seeds that came, right? These short pieces. So if you pick them as overlapping or non-overlapping space, adjacent, non-adjacent, minimizers, or compressed, they have different forms. And each one will affect the size of your hash table. So if you want to pick every 100 character one piece, then you are reducing the number of seeds you pick. At the end, whatever method you are using, whatever form of seeds you are using, you should maintain the sensitivity. Meaning that whenever I'm searching for this read, if it exists in your reference genome, you, know, you should report it using your index, regardless whatever seeds you are using. Any questions so far? Okay. So now the second uh, step, after we have this index, we want to look for, for example, the family name that starts with this alphabet. So what we do, we already have the index. We already have the reference genome, and we got one piece of read from the sequencing machine. So we chop the first seed exactly as we do for the index. We got the first seed from the read, we send it to the index, and ask the index, give me all the location that this seed occurs on the reference genome. And we got these locations. So we go to the reference genome, and we retrieve a piece from the reference genome that start at this location which was reported by the index. And then we compare the full read as we do exactly with the family name, we start with the second character, third character and so on. And we compare it with the piece coming from the reference genome using some dynamic programming algorithm. And if it match, then it's okay. If it doesn't match, we just ignore these and then we record this location to the user telling him that your read matches at this location in the reference genome. We keep doing all of this to all reads we have. Okay, so I, I kept telling you we use dynamic programming, dynamic programming, but what kind of dynamic programming algorithm do I use? So there are different versions, different form of dynamic programming algorithms with different uh, goal and different properties. But um, the easiest one, for example, is edit distance. Edit distance uh, um, defined as the minimum number of insertion deletions and substitutions between two strings. Does all of you know it of distance? Okay, cool. So there is also Hamming distance. Hamming distance is the minimum number of substitutions or the number of substitution differences or XOR operation, the result of differences by XOR operation between the two strings. So it of distance is more challenging than Hamming distance because it includes insertions and deletions. And here's an example to uh, compare organization and operation, for example. So you have, for example, to compare this or to make the word organization looks like operation, you need to perform two insertions and five deletions from this uh, text such that this will match that. Or you can do different operation, for example, the exact match, and you do the deletion in this location and another four deletions here. And at the end, you will get edit distance equals seven. Why? Because the number of operations performed here is two and another five, so you get seven. However, for this example, organization and translation, you could do, do it in three um, forms or more. Um, here, for example, you can do a large number of operations, but here is less. So we always pick the minimum number of operations, which is four, but here it was five. We have three operations here and another one and another one here. So the other distance always the minimum number of uh, differences we do between two things. And we, we did our first read mapping algorithm in 2009, uh, which is hash based uh, method. Okay, so now this is the sequencing machine that provides you some data within 44 hours. And it can provide you 378 million character per minute. However, when we get all of these reads and we will try to send them to our algorithm, the best algorithm can analyze this workload by this group of 2 million character per minute. So you can see there is at least 150x slowness between your read mapping algorithm and the machine. And the machine is, uh, is developed really to be very fast and it's keep increasing its throughput accuracy and reducing the cost almost every six months or every year or so. But the remapping algorithm is not developing at the same pace. Okay, so 
Now I show you how we do read mapping, and I show you that read mapping is a problem for uh, the, 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 the out of it's really slow, but what makes it slow? So as any problem in computer science, we want to uh, accelerate it. We need to know the bottleneck that caused this slowness. So that's why we profile read mapping, and we have three key observations. So the first one, when we analyze the execution time of read mapping algorithm, we find that around 90% or more of the execution time is spent on only dynamic programming algorithm or hidden distance, just finding the differences between two texts. Because hash table by nature or fundamentally it's all one. It's extremely fast to provide you the results. And the later stage you need to revive, verify these texts using dynamic programming algorithm. That's why we spend so much time on this. And in yesterday talk, he told me around 80% they found for very latest algorithm. So this percentage could be go from 80 to 90, somewhere depends on the algorithm you are using, but still the observation that the bottleneck and dynamic programming algorithm. The second key observation we have here, when you go and compare using dynamic programming algorithm, you will find vast majority of these locations that you are verifying using expensive algorithm are having a lot of uh, dissimilarity. So they have high dissimilarity between the texts such that you are computing very expensive, uh, um, using very expensive algorithm, but at the end you are not using these uh, computations. So they are not beneficial for you because these two texts are dissimilar. So you don't care about them and you just discard them. So we really need to do something about these locations that have very high dissimilarity before we verify them using computationally expensive algorithms. And the third observation, okay, we keep telling you that dynamic programming algorithms are expensive and it takes a lot of time, so why not avoiding it? Why not use just some linear algorithm somewhere there and using it rather than using dynamic programming? So actually dynamic programming algorithm is doing really good and it's very beneficial for our case. Why is that? Think about comparing Netherlands and Switzerland. You really need to enumerate all the a combination of these letters such that you can tolerate some insertion or deletions. Because you can't just easily compare the first with the first, second with the second, and that's it. Because it could be one deleted character. So you need to show, you need to check the effect of uh, this deletion there. So you compare the full word with the first letter. You check the first letter here, 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 until you find match. Then you compare the full letter with the first two characters, the full uh, word with the third or three characters, and so on, until you, you get the result for the two words. Okay. You can see from this pattern, there are a lot of repeated computation involved, right? You already compared this with S, so why you compare it again here with S and then W? So that's why we are using dynamic programming algorithm, so such that we store some of these computation in a table, and whenever we need it later on, we go back to that cell and we use the value recorded in that cell later on. So dynamic programming is really beneficial for us, save a lot of computation. However, because we are going back and forth in this dynamic programming table to reuse these results, so there are a lot of data dependencies between the values in this table. For example, whenever you want to calculate this cell or this, then you need to go to that cell or this or this, one of them, and use one of these values here in this computation. That's why you can't compute the second row unless you, com you already compute the first row, for example. So you need to calculate the first and second and third and so on. Or you can do it column-wise. So the first column, second column, third column, and so on, or anti-diagonal shape. And that's why we can't accelerate it using hardware architecture, for example. What you can do, for example, is having many cores, and each core doing one dynamic programming problem. Then you can do a lot of parallelism there. And the third thing, you can't, you could, for example, if you reach here, and you say, okay, I have five mismatches and my threshold is three, for example, but these two texts having uh, at least five differences, so we can stop computing here. 
No, this is not the case, especially if you are using global alignment, which is one type of the time algorithm or the pairwise alignment. We need really to reach the very last cell of this table, which is here. So we need to compute all the way until we go to that cell, and if it says five, then there are five differences. And it depends on your threshold that you set to earlier. If it is three, then this is ha having more differences, so we just ignore these two things. So you cannot stop in the middle, you cannot accelerate because there are data dependencies. Then what should we do? And that's why we designed new algorithms and hardware architecture to accelerate the entire rebounding process, not only the alignment. And our goal in this work is to reduce the time spent of calculating the optimal alignment of genome analysis problem. And we're not targeting just a new algorithm or just a new hardware architecture. To do one of them is really bad, because you are not leveraging the full power that you learn in computer science or computer uh, engineering or uh, electric engineering, for example. So to do a very nice job in read mapping, you really need to develop something that discovers block directions. A new algorithm that is aware about the hardware and new hardware architecture that can give some full power to the algorithm that you have in hand. And if anyone of you watch this, these two movies, we have Gattaca and Tomorrowland, this recent one for four years. So if you watch these movies, what they have is a smartwatch where you put your finger and it has a micro needle, extract a little piece of blood, then analyze it directly, read your DNA, and then identify you based on your DNA. And this is done in really few seconds, or portion of seconds. So if we can have such smartwatch in our, uh, these days, or in the near future, it will be great to have it in a hospital, for example, where it analyzes our DNA in the near future. Unfortunately, we don't have such a machine that can read the, even the full DNA without analyzing it. So think about having a read mapper and sequencing machine combined together on the same die or on the same chip. Okay, so we still have this open question where and how to enable fast, not only fast, but also accurate as I mentioned, and cheap privacy preserving exabyte scale analysis of genomic data, data. We don't know where to do all of this. Should we do it at CPU side, GPU, FPGA, in sequencing machine, or in somewhere else? So we are very good at building computer architecture for conventional computer. We are improving the memory, we are improving the CPU, we are improving the SSD, for example. But when it comes to the sequencing machines, we are getting a very heavy workload coming from there. And if we wait like 44 hours until the sequencing machine provides the full uh, FASTQ file or the full file of reads, and then we store it in the SSD, then we send it to the main memory, then we send it to the caches, then we send it to the cores. That will consume a lot of time and a lot of energy. And then we need to store the result back from the CPU, caches, main memory to the SSD, for example, which is really expensive. So for us, we need to think about a new way. We need really to process these genomic data where it makes sense, such that where it resides. So if these genomic data coming from the sequencing machine then we really need to find a solution that can be integrated in these sequencing machines. So we don't need to move them into this conventional architecture. We could directly move them to the FPGA or GPU or even heterogeneous architecture such that we combine many uh, processing cores. Or we can use 3D stack memory or uh, we can customize our own architecture without moving the data outside the sequencing machine. And we know that most speed up comes from parallelism enabled by both novel architectures and algorithms, not one of them. And this is true basically for many uh, applications. Many companies realize that, such as the Japanese preferred networks, where they have their own specialized MM core for deep learning acceleration. So think about having this specialized chip, having four dies that can accelerate some deep learning uh, um, application by using some dedicated matrix arithmetic blocks, very small one with a large number of them in a single chip. This is true for Surpress, where they have this huge uh, chip compared to the GPU, the latest GPU we have, that can accelerate machine learning uh, algorithms. 
and this is true as well for the French startup called UPMAM, where they have recently the, the DRAM, uh, these DEMs or the, the chips that you already can plug it to, to your motherboard. This is normal DRAM, it acts as normal DRAM, but it is it is able to do uh, processing inside the DRAM. So you don't need to move the data from the DRAM to the CPU or to the caches then to the CPU. So you can do some bitwise operations, simple one or more complex inside the DRAM chip. Tesla, for example, they have they realized the same importance by having a dedicated or specialized door for driving cars and even they get duplicated chip for reliability and safety, we have duplicated cameras and power supplies. So why not doing exactly the same thing for genomics, for example? And I think one of the companies that's producing this sequencing machine realizes that as well. So they last year acquired Inicodino, which is a company that used FPGA chip to process some of these genomic data. So I think they are going to have this FPGA chip integrated inside their own machine. In the, in the near future. So this is very uh, recently used and they did uh, as well start negotiating about with the other company which is BackBio. So Illumina producing these very short pieces, BackBio producing the very long pieces. So they were negotiating about acquiring BackBio such that one machine can produce for you a long with high accuracy reads or uh, short and long in the same machine. So think about having this machine that is able to process your genomic data inside the machine without the need to move it to CPUs. And that's why we need help from people like you, from computer science department. They can develop algorithms, smart algorithms, very accurate, such that we can implement them in hardware to process this huge workload. So what are the going direction to accelerate this problem? What are other researchers doing? So there are three key directions. You can follow one of them or all of them. So the first one is seed filtering techniques, meaning that when you, whenever you ask the hash table to provide you the location in the reference genome, so these locations are huge. It could be very huge amount of location that you need to verify, or it could be small. It depends on how, how frequent this seed appears in that reference. So there, they do some heuristics to reduce this number of locations so that they send only a few of them to the reference genome, pick these segments and send only a few of them to the ref to dynamic programming algorithm. The second direction, before you send this segment to the dynamic programming algorithm, what they do is they do some heuristics to filter these two uh, texts. So they use some algorithm to tell the, the, the user that these two texts potentially they are not, uh, they have a lot of dissimilarity. So don't do direct programming algorithm. Don't verify them. Because obviously they have a lot of similarities. So they develop such algorithm which can tell you very fast whether they are similar or dissimilar. Or you can accelerate the dynamic programming itself. As I mentioned, you can place many cores in the same chip. Each core can do two strings verification, for example. Here an explanation of the three directions. So again, back to our example, we take a seed from the read, we send it to the hash table, we get a bunch of location, and now, instead of going to the reference to get the genome and extract all these uh, segments from appears at this, these locations, what we do is we reduce some of them using seed filter technique, and then from the reference genome we get only a few of them, but now we don't apply dynamic programming, we apply pre-alignment filtering, and then if it's a really good match, then we send it to dynamic programming and we do the verification. But if it's not a good match, then we just ignore them and we don't do dynamic programming algorithm. By this method, or using these three key directions, we could reduce the workload of readmap. Okay, I'm going to explain a few examples that we developed our research group for, for the three uh, directions. So the first one we presented in 2013 that do some uh, two heuristics. So the first one, the first observation is that you want to develop uh, adjacent seed filtering or adjacent k -mer. What does that mean? So think about this read and this is the reference. And now you extract from the read three non-overlapping seeds. So I will take this A's as a seed, then the C's as a seed, 
then the t has a c. And now I go to the hash table and I ask the hash table, give me all the locations that this c appears. So give me this location, this location, that, and so on. And the same thing for the three c's. Now, from my observation, I'm always looking for this read to appear in the reference genome, right? So if I'm picking three adjacent seeds, then obviously they should appear next to each other in the reference, right? Otherwise they are just random or just noise. For example, think about um, this location and this. The seeds are really far from each other. So probably this is not a good match. So you don't need to verify that. But if you think about this location, you can see three seeds appear really adjacent to each other. And this is a good match. So for that, we need to sort all the location coming from the hash table such that we know which one is adjacent to which one, right? And after sorting, then we can know that these are adjacent seeds, so only verify this location, not the other location. So this is very fast heuristic that can reduce the amount of workload without losing any sensitivity. So you are not losing any correct location. And you can adjust the distance between the seeds such that you can, for example, tolerate deletions or insertion. Because if there are a large portion of deletion, then the two seeds will be apart from each other by certain distance. So you can play with this threshold. You can make it uh, configurable based on the user. So they are not necessarily to be uh, uh, really adjacent to each other, but zero dust types. So all of these are invalid location. And now the second algorithm that we presented in the same paper, we call it cheap k-mers. So I have an example for that. So here think about the reference genome. And you already sent a C to the hash table, many of them. So the hash table for each C give you a list of locations. So this is a list of four locations. And for another C, you get only two locations. For another seed that appears a lot or very frequent in the free reference, so it appears more than a thousand times, and the other seeds appear two locations, and here at uh, two thousand locations and one thousand locations. So the heuristic says if any seed appears too many times in the reference, probably this is a false positive, or this is, doesn't have any scientific meaning, so just ignore it. So whenever I have a list of locations larger than a threshold, let it be 500, for example, then you ignore all of these lists. You don't verify them because they are very expensive and cause you frequent verification using that and programming algorithm. You could also, what you can do if this is a list of locations, is 1,000 locations, you could use only the first 500 and remove the rest of them, for example. Again, these are heuristics. You need to try an error and try which one doesn't cause a loss in the sensitivity. Meaning that whenever I send a read to your algorithm, I really need to see all the correct locations there. If I'm losing some of them, it can be correct for some application. But if I'm losing all of them, then this is a bad algorithm. And I'm really sure that computer science students are really smart enough to design such algorithms that are able to do this process in a very fast way. So, again, this is not necessarily to be hash table. It could be any data structure. Think about trees, birds, wheel, and transformation with FM index, such that you compress the tree, or think about anything, suffix uh, list, suffix tree, and so on. Okay, so at the end, we save a lot of computation by only uh, instead of 3,004 locations we verified using dynamic programming algorithm and then we got some of these locations verified. And that's what we call the fast hash. So this is the conclusion I'm going to skip. And this is the paper, this is the link to the paper where we publish the source code. So you can play with it. You can change different parameters, you can play with it and see uh, whether your algorithm or your proposed changes have some benefits. Now the second direction is pre-alignment filtering. Again, this step applied only before the dynamic programming algorithm. So we realize that the dynamic programming is computationally expensive and for that we need to reduce the workload we send it to the dynamic programming algorithm. So we use kind of a filter where we have many steps 
and the each step we filter some of these two strings so the input to the filter should be two strings and we compare them together so in the first direction where fast hash algorithm the input was the seeds coming from the hash table but here no the two strings which is the read and the one coming from the reference so this uh, key direction after the fast hash algorithm so at each stage of the filter, we filter some of them and then we send to the dynamic programming at later stage. However, for the filter it's really challenging. And we need to filter all the incorrect ones or some of them. We can't filter really all of them. If we do so, then our algorithm is 100% accurate. Then we don't need the dynamic programming algorithm. But because this is a heuristic, so we need to filter most of the incorrect ones. But at the same time, we need to keep all the correct ones. Any two strings that really match each other within a certain threshold, we need to keep them and send them to the dynamic programming algorithm. If we delete some of them, then we have false negative, and this is bad. So though this is a heuristic, but we don't want any false negative. So it's OK to have false positive. It's OK to have some of these strong ones pass through the filter to the dynamic programming. Why is that? because we are still using dynamic programming algorithm which is 100% accurate so whenever we pass some wrong ones this, this step will filter all of them and keep only the correct ones now we need to do this of course very quickly much faster than the dynamic programming algorithm why is that? because this is the goal of our peer alignment filter to accelerate this step so if this is slower than this then we are not providing any benefit this is an example of the first work we did, we call it the Gatekeeper, published in 2017 in the best journal in the bioinformatics field. And the idea is very simple. So if two strings differ by E differences, then we can align them using two E shift. And I'm going to explain you what does that mean. So the key idea is that you need to use shifted hamming distance. It's not hamming distance, it's shifted one. And we need two e plus one of these masks. So we generate for every two text or every two strings two e plus one bet vectors, and we, we do an operation between all of these vectors such that we can recognize the differences at this part. And from using by doing this, we implemented an FPGA and we achieved really high speed up. So we got 90x to 130x faster than SHD, which is another pre-aligned filter, and the adjacency filter, which is part of the first direction, which do seed filtering. So this is much faster than doing seed filtering, for example, because you need to do sorting. Sorting, as we know, it's also expensive, right? However, this has some false positive, and as I said, it's okay to have false positive because you still need need the dynamic programming algorithm, but doesn't have any false negative. And the addition of gatekeeper to a read mapper, which we published in 2009 and later get updated in 2013, result in 10x end-to-end -end speed up. Okay, now, what's the algorithm? Here's an example. So I have two words, Istanbul and Istanbul. I want to compare them. So I'm using now having this. So I just do your XOR operation between the two texts. And what I get? eight matches, right? Because they are perfectly matching each other. So now I want to do myself a difference. I want to impose a difference to one of these texts, right? So let it be a deletion. I want to delete this character. So after I delete A, so all these trailing character will be shifted by one step to the, to the left, right? Because I delete the character myself. And now if I give you this new text, and I ask you to find the differences with this, so if you do, again, having distance, you will see three matches and a lot of mismatches. Although I just did one difference, one deletion. So how to fix this? That's why we need edit distance. But how to do edit distance for these two? Now, remember that we delete one character, so all these characters shifted to the left, right? So to fix that, what we did is we have another copy that is shifted to the right. Why shift it to the right? To cancel the effect of deletion. Now let, let's do another explore with the first word, Istanbul, without the A, and the, the other version, the shifted version. And when I do explore with this, I get three matches. When I do explore with the other one, I get four matches. 
Now, because I did the explore, so I got binary result. And for the second one as well. So now I have three zeros and four zeros. And this is the correct result. So if you count the number of zeros here and there, how we got seven zeros means seven matches and single mismatch. But now the question is how to collect these? Should I count them simply? But what if I have too many? As I said, we have two e plus one bet vectors in general. So one way to go is just do and operation between them. By doing that, I get this the correct result, and here it shows me that there's a single difference at this position, which is really what I did, the deletion of A from here, right? So this is the key idea of shifted Hamming distance. We keep shifting versions of the original text, and we compare it using the XOR. And this is a complete uh, example of how we do it generally for, in read mapping. So it's really hard to track these things because very small text, but here is one of the text which is a query, and this is a segment coming from the reference. And I set my threshold to be 3. So how many of these bet factors I need? 2, e plus 1. And e here is, I set it to 3. So I have 7 many bet vectors. How we got these 7 vectors? So the first one is just simply XOR between the two. Just XOR and I get the result. And these three masks, what I did, I called them deletion. Why deletion? Because when I delete a character, all the trailing character will be shifted to the left, right? So to generate this deletion mask, I need to shift to the right, such that I fix the deletion. So the first one here, or the second vector, I shift the query one step to the right, then I compare it using X or with the reference, such that I get this. Now how we get this? We shift the query two steps to the right, and then do XOR. And this three steps to the right, then we do XOR. Now how we generate the three insertions? So exactly as the deletion, but the opposite shift direction. So, so when I insert a character, I'm shifting all the characters to the right. So now I need to shift to the left. So I shift the query one step to the left, then I do the XOR with the reference. And I keep gradually shifting and the XOR until I generate the two E plus one bet vectors. Now, if you observe the pattern of these, you will see this is the correct answer that I want to count. So, apparently, if you can clearly... Uh, you can see that. Okay. So, apparently, you can see this is exact match. This is what I got from here as well. And then the single difference, this is T, this is G. But after that, all of it is a perfect match. And then there is some deleted character from here. You can see there are two C's, but one C here. So there is a deleted C. That's why the zeros appears in this vector, not in this. Because that's why I call it one deletion mask. So whenever you have one deleted character after a match is, then the zeros will appear in the next vector. So you have all of these zeros because this is perfectly matched. Until you reach here, you can see there are two A's and there is a single A here with G. And yeah, this A is shifted here. And you will have A and G deleted. So you have two mismatches here. Okay, so now we know this is the correct answer, but how to trace it? So the goal is to track these diagonally consecutive zeros and you need to design an algorithm to solve this problem so as I mentioned before what we did is just AND operation you AND all of these bet vectors such that the zero always dominate so you got it in the final bet vector or the final answer right? however this has a problem think about we want to know these ones right? because this means uh, two mismatches so we want to know that there are two ones we want to know that there is a single one here and a single one there. But whenever vertically you have a zero, zero will dominate because we are doing we are doing hand operation. So the zero will cancel any one vertically. So if we have a zero here, it will cancel this one. If we have a zero there, it will cancel that one. So we did another heuristic to fix this problem, and we said, okay, 
we observe here there are a lot of zeros. They are randomly everywhere. For example, here two zeros, single zero, single zero, and so on. So we said, okay, let's replace them by ones, such that when we do an operation, we don't cancel the ones that we are looking for. For example, this one, we don't want to cancel it. So vertically, if we see any other zero, we just change it to one. And you can see here they are smart, smooth, nice uh, bit vector of ones rather than zeros. But what was the threshold for us? So we pick one zero or two zeros. So we don't replace all zeros, just either one zero or two zeros. So here we have we still have three zeros, for example, three zeros. And that what causes us to have a false positive. So you can see in this period, for example. So we have two ones, but what we got in the result is a single one. Why is that? Because we still have a segment of zeros here, which are very long, and we couldn't replace them. Because this zero will dominate and cancel this one. But again, as I mentioned, it's okay to have um, less ones, meaning that false positive. So I am underestimating the number of mismatches or the differences between the two texts. And that's how we guarantee that we are always having false negative. We never overestimate the number of ones. Because we either get the same number or less than that. Any question? And this is the correct answer we got from a uh, dynamic programming algorithm, which is 100% accurate. So when we compare the result, we got exactly the same location as reported by these algorithms. So we can know from the pre-alignment filtering that there is something going on here, here, and there. But we might get less number of differences. Now, if your threshold is 2, for example, and this reported 3, then this is wrong um, or dissimilar text, so we don't need to do this step. And you can think about implementing this in FPGA, for example, or GPU. This is just a bitwise operation, right? You do some shift, some XOR, and then end operation. Done. So this is extremely fast to be implemented on hardware and accelerator, or even SIMD instruction, for example. And this is basically the main difference, the fundamental difference between dynamic programming algorithm and what we are proposing. So what we are proposing is just simply a bitwise operation. So we are comparing... <coughs> sorry. <coughs> We are comparing a character by character, if you see. So we are comparing the A with the C with the T with the A and so on. We keep doing this until we reach that. So we don't have any data dependencies. So everything here can be highly parallelizable using uh, FPGAs or GPUs. And our goal after having these two things is to track the consecutive zeros. If you have another smarter way rather than using AND operation, for example, then you can design your algorithm such that you can solve this problem by just tracking the number of zeros. And then you can process using multi-core or SIMD instructions, GPUs, and FPJ, for example. And in that time when we implemented this in 2016, it was the first work that implement uh, pre-alignment filtering on FPGA such that you can achieve a high speed up. So instead of having all of these two strings to be verified using dynamic programming algorithm, we only send very few of them to the dynamic programming algorithm. And this is how we implemented an FPGA. So an FPGA, you know, as you know, that FPGA has a, a large number of lookup tables. So your algorithm should leverage that. That's why we always need to design algorithm and hardware architecture, not one of them. So when we know that there's inside the FPJ that we are using five input lookup table. So we leverage our algorithm, we redesign it such that we use this lookup table with five inputs. So if it has six input or seven input or even three input lookup table, then you need to really change your algorithm such that can leverage uh, minimum number of lookup tables rather than using two lookup tables per operation. So what we did, for each five bits, we output single bit here, which is the one in the middle. And we check if, if we have the pattern 101 or 1001. This process can change the single zero or the two zeros into ones in the bit vector so that we reduce the false positive. 
And we did this for many uh, lookup tables at the same time. And the nice thing about the FPGA, regardless of the number of lookup tables we are using, if your design is really small, or the critical path is really small, then everything can operate at single cycle. So you'll get the result for all the bit vectors, for all of them in the same time. So think about all of these, the 2e plus 1 bit vector will be generated in the same time, not as CPU serialized. And this is how we perform the, the 5 bit operation using lookup table. So we are always changing the one in the middle, and the result will be stored by one bit using each lookup table. So how many lookup tables we need? As many bits as we have in each bit vector, which is the length of one of the texts. So you can cascade two LUTs to make a uh, bigger yes, like, exactly. number of bits, right? Exactly. So if you have a lookup table in your FPGA with seven inputs or eight inputs, then you need to redesign this algorithm such that you fit bigger lookup table. Or same way if you have smaller lookup table in your uh, FPGA. So you need, you, really know, you really need to know the FPGA you have in hand, such that you can leverage the full power of that hardware you have. OK, so we implemented an FPGA. This is the CPU side, and this is the FPGA. And we have many of these cores inside the FPGA, such that we don't do only for two texts, but we do for many of them, as many as we could fit inside the FPGA logic. And we were bottlenecked by the maximum data throughput uh, moved from the CPU side to the FPGA using PCI Express. So as long as we can move some data within a clock cycle, then we could fit more cores here. And this is the logic utilization for uh, text of length 300. So we could, uh, we could only fit this many of cores in this FPGA. But we could also utilize the rest of the lookup table here if we could fit more data to the FPGA. So we need like faster PCI Express, faster driver, for example, so, such that you can feed more data to the FPGA so you can place more cores here. And I'm going to show you later on the utilization, the number of lookup tables we use for each design. So as I said, I already presented these results in the conclusion, and this is the source code. All of our designs, all of our algorithms are public online, so you can download them with data, with very nice documentation. You can uh, uh, run them now or later on. Okay, I'm going to skip the conclusion, and we also implement Gatekeeper on SIMD instructions. The code is also available in this paper, SHD, so you can download it and also using it. And this is Gatekeeper, the recent one. And now, the question. Can we do much better than uh, Gatekeeper? Can, how about scalability? So instead of doing add operation to the entire vector, such that you really need the entire thing to be loaded in the SMD register or in, in the FPGA, can we, do, can we do something with a small portion of the text rather than the full thing, such that to be scalable? For example, the read length, if we increase it to 10,000, million, and so on. And this is what we presented in Shoji. So we have this Shoji paper, again presented in Bioinformatics Journal in this year. And what we did, we observed that, if you still remember, we have these green segments of consecutive zeros. And we said the goal, we want to track these zeros, right? We want to count them. So we observed that these, long, these consecutive zeros are really long. So we want to track them. Instead of doing end operation with other vectors, where we have a lot of random zeros here and there. So we said, OK, we want to go to each vector and count them. And then we get the largest number of consecutive zeros, and that will give you the number of matches you have. And here, here I have a nice example showing this algorithm. So these vectors, as I mentioned, how we generate them exactly as gatekeeper. There's, there are no differences. And how many of them? I still need 2e plus 1. And for example, the one in the middle, how I generated, just pairwise comparison between this text and this text. So this is exact match, then I got zero. And how I generate this? By shifting by one step to one direction, then export. 
how I generate the other one, two steps, shifting, then it's four, and so on. But now, what I do, instead of doing n with all these vectors, what I do is I pick a window of size four, and I count diagonal. So I go to each diagonal, and count how many zeros do I have in this diagonal. So there's one, 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 four, one, two, one. So I said, okay, I have four zeros here, so it must be part of the correct answer I'm looking for. Why is that? Because as I observe in this paper, that the correct answer always long matches or long segments of consecutive zeros. So that's why I'm having a repeated choice to pick the one having the largest number of zeros. So I count the, the largest number of zeros, then I store it somewhere, for example here. Then I slide this search window by one step ahead, and then repeat exactly the same steps. Then where's the one with the largest number of zeros? Apparently it's here, having three, and then I store it here. But because I shift by one step, and I'm counting four steps, or four bits, then these are overlapping, right? So when I want to store the result back here, there are overlapping between the two segments I'm storing. So which one to store? For example, at this location, or this, or this. And when I want to store this vector here, which one to store here? I always pick the one increasing the number of zeros, not decreasing. Why increasing the number of zeros? Just to avoid false negative. I don't want false negative. So always increasing the number of matches is good because you are telling these two texts are similar, having more zeros. So if they are similar, then okay, you already send them to the direct programming, and then direct programming is strict enough to reject them if they are false. Then I store the result and then keep doing this for the entire bit right? just sliding the window by one step and extracting the one having a large number of consecutive zeros. And this is why I call it Trojan. Because I have slide windows, so this door slides open, which is Japanese. Why I pick four? I have a theory behind this, so I can explain it if you like. So we notice that always the, 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 the minimum number of matches, because I'm always looking for matches, right, which is zero. So the minimum number of matches could be zero, right? And to be minimum should be surrounded by ones, right? Otherwise it's not minimum. So I, my window or search window, I should look for this pattern at least. Now I notice that whenever you build this uh, matrix, you will see a lot of one, zero, one. For example, this pattern, this one, 0, then 1, in the same diagonal. So you will have a lot of these random zeros, as I noticed in Gatekeeper as well. So to ignore this case, we want to have one bit before or after. That's why I'm always looking for four bits, such that I can avoid these random zeros. Any question? And if you notice from this nice graph... Uh, sorry, I have yeah. a question. Uh, we will the previous slide. Uh, uh -huh. So it does, it's consistent if we start left to side to the right or right to the left. Very good question. Okay, so basically there is no difference if you start from right to left or left to right. You might notice some differences around the, this um, intersection between, for example, this long segment of zeros and this one. You might notice some differences here, but the correct should be always correct. The result should be always correct. So there is no difference searching from right to left or left to right. Why is that? Because you already capture all the information in the diagonals. So whenever you have zero in one of the diagonals, it means exact match. It doesn't change the fact if you're reading it from right or left. Including something? Yes. Right. You can see, if you, read, if you start reading from here, then you have the zero here already captured. And you start reading from here, you have four zeros uh. and four zeros. And the good thing, as I mentioned, we want to reduce or ignore the false negative. That's why we do overlapping here. So if you do the overlapping from right or left, you're already reducing or increasing the number of zeros. 
So that's why you never have any false negative. Okay, we implement this in FPGA as well. And FPGA guide. I moved recently to GPU. I like GPU. I like FPGAs. But it depends on you. If your algorithm really sounds best for FPGA, which means like fixed point operation rather than floating point, then go ahead with the FPGA. And we said, okay, we are doing counting, right? We count the number of zeros. We don't do end operation. End operation in GP and FPGA is really cheap, computationally cheap. We don't need a large number of local tables. But if you want to implement a counter in FPGA, and what we are using is 4-bit counter, right? So we count at most 4 bits. So to do a counter with 4 bits, we need 4 D flip flops, right? So we need to wait 4 clock cycles to count a bit vector of a 4 bit width. So to avoid that, we just, because we are restricting ourselves to always the length of 4, regardless of the read length, even if it is million, 10 million, doesn't matter. Your window size is always fixed to 4. And this is a nice thing about Shoji or Shoji. And we have recorded all the possible values or all possible combination of uh, four bits. We record them and we record their count of zeros. So here we record four, here three, here three, and here two, and here three, for example. By doing that, a lookup table in FPGA can tell you very fast, using one clock cycle, how many zeros in this four bit uh, vector. So in this way, we avoid having to wait for clock cycle to count. And we do this for all bit vectors at the same time, so all the computation is done in one clock cycle. And this is the paper, and this is the source code. You can download it for CPU and FPGA. You can implement it yourself and see how it works. Okay, any question before moving on? Okay. So, we have recently developed Sneak Snake. It's available in archive. We didn't publish it yet. And in Sneak Snake, we observe exactly the same observation as Shoji that these consecutive zeros are really long. But the difference here, we observe that they are always non overlapping. So you have a segment of zeros, then another one going forward, then another one, and so on. So they are non overlapping. And non overlapping meaning that you don't really need to count them and separate them from the other zeros having uh, these um, randomly placed within or overlapped with the segment that you are looking for. So if you find that very long segment, then you can ignore all the rest bit vectors. You, you don't need to search them. And that motivates us to do this algorithm. And we observe that this problem now becomes a single net routing problem in VLSI chip. In VLSI chip, Meaning that if you have your laptop or mobile phone, you will see a lot of these black squares, right? VLSI chips. So in these, they are normal system on chip, meaning that they have uh, multi modules integrated with the same guys. So you will see a lot of bins with this chip, input and output as well. So imagine that you have one of these inputs here and one of the output there, and you want to. Uh, have a signal going from the input to the output, but you want to avoid some modules in your chip. And this is what is a uh, sneaky snake. So you want to go from this point to that point with less obstacles or shortest path traffic. And by doing this, we really get a significant result compared to all other pre-aligned filtering. So we got up to four orders magnitude more accurate meaning that list false positive compared to Shoji and Gatekeeper. And Sneak Snake accelerate the state of the art dynamic programming algorithm, which is called Idlib, published in Bioinformatics 2017, by 37x speed up using only CPU implementation. And using the hardware FPGA and GPU, we could get up to 400x speed up using this pre-aligned filter. Okay, so now what's the algorithm? Again, the same matrix. We set the threshold to 3. And to make it simpler, now we will lay it down horizontally. So in this diagonal, just we flip it horizontally. So we got this. And we're still having 2e plus 1 many bit vectors. So how we generate, for example, this? Just
just explore how we generate this, we shift by one step, then it's sort two steps, three steps, and so on. Okay, now to convert it to real side chip, what we did, think about the one as an obstacle and the zero as a billable path. So you'll get this shape from this to this. Every one is obstacle, meaning black box. Every zero is white box, meaning available path where you can move on. And now the problem is we want to move from the entrance to the exit. So you have the snake, you should go through this maze until arrive at the exit. And remember the distance threshold is three. Okay, now what do we do? So we have the snake and we want to look for a path to go on or move forward. So we check the first step. Can we move on? No, you have zero steps, zero steps, zero steps. Can we move on? Yes, we have four available steps. And here one single step, zero step, and single step. We said, okay, let the snake move forward four steps, plus one to avoid this obstacle. So we select this path, plus one, and we stop here. And when we avoid this obstacle, we reduce the available obstacle that we can avoid by one. So now from three, we go back down to two. And now we repeat exactly the same steps. Can we pass from here? No, no. Yes, you have four steps. No, two steps. No, no, no. So we said, okay, which path to pick? Well, this is a greedy snake or a sneaky snake. So it picks always the longest path to move forward. So we pick the one with four steps and we avoid another obstacle here, and then we stop here and we repeat the same steps. But whenever we avoid an obstacle, we reduce the available obstacle by one. So now we have only single obstacle that we can avoid. We repeat exactly the same steps again. We have single step, single step, single step. So which one to pick? Doesn't matter. All of them have the same length. So we can pick any one, and we already avoid this obstacle, so we reduce this by zero. Whenever we arrive zero, we check. Are we in it from the exit? Do we arrive at our destination? If yes, meaning that these two texts that we compare to generate these vectors having similarity less or more than, sorry, having this similarity equal to the threshold or this time. So meaning that these are two texts are similar to each other. So this is a good match, then we send it to the data programming. However, this is not the only optimization we are doing in Sneak Snake compared to Shoji or Gatekeeper. What we need to compute is not all of these bit factors. So you really don't need the entire matrix to be built. What you really need is only these cells. Why is that? Because when you compare here, you find an obstacle, so you don't need to continue computing, right? So you can stop here. Same thing here, same thing there. So whenever you have an obstacle, just stop computing. Don't do anything. And whenever you have available back, you keep computing until you get another obstacle. So this is exactly what you need to compute in this area. By doing that, you already solve, so save some computation here and there. Same thing here, here, there, there. So this is really very fast algorithm, even to be implemented in CPU or in C code, C++, and so on, without any vectorization, without any parallelizable uh, stuff. Do you have and, any yeah. chalkbox mechanism? Because it's really greedy, right? You don't mm -hmm. guarantee anything. It, yeah. There might be something like uh, three consecutive uh, you know, open position places that mm -hmm. might be the best. Let's say just after this four consecutive holes, right? Okay, very good question. So now the thing, we forget about dynamic programming algorithm and remap. And we convert the entire problem into single net routing problem, right? So now how to say which one is best for us based on single net routing problem. Single net routing problem asks you to find a path with less number of obstacles. So whatever one provided the, le the least number of obstacles, then this is the best for us. And based on that, we are always picking the greedy choice. 
So it's really difficult. It's really cannot happen to find another path that having this number of cars to go. So we proved already this in the paper that is really optimal. You can't get any path with this number of cars to go. Because we are always picking the one with this number of cars to go. Unless you have an equivalent path that has the same number of cars to go. But can't be this. And yeah, that's true. This is less than the optimal for oh, me. Oh, because now. moving up and down is free. Yes, exactly. So in read mapping, dynamic programming, if you move up, I mean you have one deletion. If you move down, you have one insertion, for example. And which one is better for you, insertion or deletion? This is based on what we call a score system. So the user will specify for the deletion, you need to penalize your uh, alignment by this much. For deletion, you need to penalize it by this much. And based on which one is the larger penalty for deletion or insertion, then you decide which one is best for you, to go up or down. But here we don't care. We can go up or down at no cost. And this is the beauty of this uh, algorithm. It's really fast. But it's always optimal in terms of single net routing power. And we do all the computation on the fly, so we don't store these in bit vector or registers. We don't need to do that. We just need to store this value. So we store this value, and whenever we reach the exit, we check the value in the counter, and that's it. Okay, is it clear? Okay, cool. So this is the lookup table utilization, as I promised, for the 3 p aligned filter I presented. So you can see for single core, there are always around, or more or less, around 1% of the FPGA lookup table uh, we have in Dynamics 7, Vertex 7, VC 7 or 9. So if you are using ultra scale, for example, or more advanced FPGA, these numbers will get really down, up to half, for example. And based on this, you can estimate how many cores we can place in the FPGA chip. So if you have 1% of utilization, then you can place hundreds of them to fully utilize the entire FPGA chip. But because we are bounded by, as I mentioned, PCI Express, where we move data from the CPU to the FPGA board, so we could only place 16 of them. Of course, you can do much better, because the driver we used for PCI Express was very old at the time of the development. We could replace by the latest one, or you could have <coughs> More advanced PCI Express, for example, rather than generation 3, you could get generation 4 with 8 claims or more, for example. Okay, so we provide the source code for CPU, GPU, and FPGA. You can get it from here, along with uh, toy data and nice documentation where you can test and try it yourself. And yeah, one more thing about the sneak snake. So here, there are checkpoints, right? Whenever we get an obstacle, we terminate, and then we repeat the same computation, right? That's why it can be parallelizable easily in GPU by dividing this area and that area separately, so you can solve them independently from each other. However, you don't know this information in advance, how many steps available to you. So you can greedily divide this matrix into any sub-matrix of any size, right? can be 16 bits, so every 16 bit, consider them a sub-problem, or every 64, and so on. How we can decide on this? This is again design choice. For example, if you want to implement an in, in, uh, unsigned integer 32, then it's a wise choice to select every 32 bit as single variable and implement it on GPU, for example. Right? And if you want to do UN64, you can do the same thing for every 64 bits, and so on. Okay, what we notice in all of these works that we developed, that we are bounded now by data movement. We really need to move all this text from the CPU to the FPGA, right? So how we can address this issue? So processing in, in memory can alleviate the bottom. What does processing in memory mean? So as I mentioned, the UPMAP French startup, where they have, where they allow to allow you to do processing inside DRAM, right? So they have this normal DRAM, you can plug it in your motherboard, but it has also cores next to the um, DRAM chip. 
where you can process things. So we will need to design mapping and filtering algorithm that fed processing your memory such that we don't need to move the data back and forth. Okay, so this is more explanation about the processing in memory or the need for processing in memory. This is a conventional uh, CPU architecture where you have the CPU cores and several a little or cache hierarchy here and connected to the VRAM with uh, power hanging buses. And when you move data between the memory to the caches to the cores, mm -hmm. you are consuming a lot of energy. Because these buses are very fast but power hungry in nature. And in this paper uh, for mobile devices presented in S Plus 2018, they observed that 62.7% of the total system energy is spent only on data movement. So imagine how expensive to move data from here to here to here. So if we can avoid that, it will be really nice and more efficient. And one of the solutions is to move the computation close to data. You could also move the memory to the computation, or move the computation to the memory. However, you are bounded by limited area and energy budget. You can't do much of computation here because you will overheat the DRAM chip, and then you will face a cooling problem and even scalability problem. So one of the proposals is to, do, to have the memory as an accelerator. So this is the CPU, this is the cache, this is the memory controller, and this is the memory bus, and this is the memory. So what we said, or what we agreed on, is to have some computation in the memory. However, what kind of computation you can think about? So there are two proposals in this area. So either you can do minimally changing memory chip by just leveraging some analog operation, for example, happening inside the DRAM chip, or by exploiting 3D stack memory. 3D stack memory I'm going to explain later on, but in this you have more freedom to implement the stuff you need. But here you can't do things uh, that are not implemented, for example, inside the DRAM. So the first proposal is to minimally change the DRAM. And this is what this paper is about. And in here they can support only this operation. For example, doing and operation or or not or majority function, for example. So only simple twice operation you can do in DRAM with this proposal. So they leverage the analog comp uh, computation capability of DRAM. You know that the DRAM has a lot of cells, memory cells, where you charge the capacitance and discharge the capacitance, right? This is how we store bits inside the memory. So these we call them analog operation, charging, discharging or having a sense amplifier in the DRAM reading the charge from the capacitance and so on. So they leverage this operation to achieve this bitwise operation. And the idea is actually activating multiple rows to perform computation. So in DRAM, I'm not sure if you are aware about the structure of the DRAM memory. So in DRAM normally we um, activate only single row to read that row from the memory. So we can't read bit by bit, it should be a line, or um, the, 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 the memory line at each time. So we read the line, we activate it, then we read it using the sense amplifier, then we read the charge in the capacitor, if it is more than threshold, then it's 1, if it is less than threshold, then it's 0. This is how we read the line of bits from the memory. So instead of activating a single line, what they do in this paper, activating many of them, and they propose to activate three of them at the same time. And this is the paper called AMBIT, presented in Micro 2017. And now I'm going to show you, show you an example of how we do that. So these are the memory cells. So as I told you, we can't read single memory cell, but for simplicity, I'm showing you just single cell. But you can think about this entire row, like 512 bits, for example. And this is the same thing, this is a complete row, this is a complete row. And this is sense amplifier. Sense amplifier meaning that you have some component that can read the charge stored in your capacitor. So this is a capacitor, has charge zero, and this is a capacitor has a full charge. It could be 5 volt, 2 volt, and so on. This is just an example. So we activate three of them at the same time. So by uh, closing the circuit, 
by closing the circuit, you are reading the charge in the sense amplifier. So now when you sh close the circuit, you share, you share the, the charge that is stored in this capacitor. So previously, it was two charge, and this is, uh, uh, has zero charge. So when you close the circuit, all the charge gets shared. And based on the majority function, then the sense amplifier recognizes it as one or zero. So when you close the circuit, this one will sense the perturbation in the charge, meaning the change. And then it will recognize for you, based on the majority function, that it should be 1 or 0. And then in the paper, they recognize that by having this function, and you are doing, uh, you are really good in digital design, you can simplify this into this. So whenever you have a C equal to 1, this will be 0, so it will be opt out, and then you will have A plus B, so you can perform OR operation, for example. But whenever C is 0, then this is will can be cancelled, because this is multiplication, for example, or AND operation, and this will be 1, so you are doing A times B, which is an AND operation. And by activating three rows at the same time, so you can do any operation you like by having or and plus the not, of course. So there are many proposals, I'm going to show you after this slide, there are many papers doing a simple bitwise operation inside VRAM or more complex ones. So any question about this proposal? Just how to do a bitwise, simple bitwise operation inside VRAM. So now, we didn't implement our self gatekeeper, for example, in, inside memory. But you can think about it yourself. You can implement it and have a new project, for example. Because whatever you need from, for gatekeeper is just shaft, XOR, and AND operation. And you have all of them already implemented for DRAM, for example. How do you shift? Yeah, the shift is proposed by other papers. Okay. So they already have it. They have not operation. They have AND, XOR, everything. Okay, so now the second direction, instead of change, minimally changing the VRAM by leveraging the analog operation that already exists in VRAM, they said, okay, we don't want that. And VRAM actually is not scaling well compared to the CPU cores, so now the proposal is to 3D stack them together. So this is a DRAM, this is another DRAM, another DRAM chip. So what they said, instead of having many of them plugged into the motherboard, they have all of them sticked on the same die by 3D stacking them on the same die. So they have DRAM on top of another DRAM on top of another DRAM such that they build this 3D cube. So each layer or each um, row of this cube is a DRAM chip where you can store data. However, the last layer of this DRAM uh, cube is a logic layer, meaning that you can think about it as FPGA where you can implement some function. Or you can place your own core in this logic layer such that you can do computation. So this is the 3D stack memory where you have many DRAM chip placed on top of logic layer by very fast buses. So these buses can transfer data by one terabits per second. This is a, an old uh, proposal, I think in 2011. I think the thing is now getting better and they have faster uh, HFC cubes. And then between the logic layer and the processor you can do some communication, but you still can do computation here for these data stored in the DRAM. So which one to pick? Whether you want a DRAM with uh, bitwise capability, computation capability, or the 3D stack memory, this is again design choice based on what you need for, for the computation. If this is only a simple bitwise operation, it's not wise to go for 3D stack memory because the energy efficiency here is really high compared to CPU, but compared to single DRAM it might not be more efficient. So these are the papers. I'm going just to show you the, the name so you can check yourself. There are fast uh, bulk bitwise and the or operation in DRAM. There's another work, AMBIT, which I presented. And in DRAM, bulk bitwise execution engine, they have more operation in this work. And now, row clone bitwise operation real DRAM chips. This is a new proposal, actually, I think this year. 
And here, actually, not necessarily for DRAM also. They have both uh, proposed operation inside other uh, memory uh, technologies, such as phase change memories. And this is the CERAC, where they propose uh, for uh, graph processing accelerator in 3D stack memory. And we want to do exactly the same thing for pre alignment folder. So we have this developed for read mapping process. We call it grim filter. So the idea of grim filter is that we notice there is a data movement problem for FPGA for GPU. So we want to leverage 3D stack memory to solve this problem. And this is again 3D stack memory where each layer is a DRAM by itself and all of them connected by very high speed bias to the logic layer where you can implement your logic. And each bank can store some data, but remember that we read the memory by rows. So you need to place your data here such that you can read one bit at a time from here, from each column, for example. And now giving this information, we implement grab filter here. And what is a gram filter? We said, okay, we don't want to implement the index or the hash table on the CPU side and move it to the 3D stack memory. So we want to have our own copy of the index stored there. So we get the reference genome, we slice it into bands, overlapping bands, because we don't want to lose sensitivity. So all these characters are covered in this band and this band. And instead of building the hash table with the C of length 12, for example, we said, give me all the combination of any seed of length 5. So what are the options? Either all of them A's, or you change this into C, G, T, then you change this into A, C, G, T, and so on, all the way until you get all of the T's. And by doing this, if I have this seed in this band, then I record 1. If I don't have it, then I record 0. And then keep doing this for all seed until I get this bet factor, which is B1. So each band will be represented by bet vector, not by the text. Okay? And I keep doing this for all bands of the reference genome. And what I got, all of these bet vectors. So I get B1, B2, and so on, all the way until I finish passing the reference genome. How many of these bands I need? So it depends on the length I pick for the band and the overlapping between this and the length of the reference genome. And here's the equation to figure out how many or what's the memory size you need for accommodating all these paths. Okay, now I already built the index or the hash table, so what else I need? Now I need to do the same thing for the read sequence, not the reference. So I got these tokens of length 5 from the read. So again, this has a lot of forms, it can be overlapping, not overlapping, minimizers, compressed, and so on. So it's up to you. And then whenever this appears in here, then I create the bet vector, same thing. So I record 1, 0, and so on. And now what I do is not comparing the bet vector, for example, but I'm comparing the bit. It's not, sorry, it's not building gatekeeper, generating all those 2 e plus 1 vectors and so on. No, what I'm doing here is just comparing bet vector to a single bet vector. So this bet vector representing the read, and I'm picking one bit vector from the reference and I compare it to here. So whenever I have this seed exist here and exist in the reference and they have many of these exist or shared between the read and the reference, meaning that there is a lot of common seeds shared between the two texts, meaning that potentially it could be high similarity between them because there is a lot of things shared between them. Then I have an counter counting the number of ones shared between the two bit vectors. And then if this number is more than a certain threshold, then this is a good similarity. If not, just ignore them and don't do dynamic programming algorithm. And these are details how we implement F as a read mapper, not only pre alignment filter. So I'm going to skip these details because of the time. And you can notice that the gram filter only simple operation, so you just uh, represent it as a bit vector, then you just compare and then count number of ones, done. It's highly parallel, why is that? Because you don't have a huge amount of hash table, for example, that you can't uh, chop it into pieces. 
and memory are bound because you need to store this bad vector somewhere. And all of these make it makes uh, or all of these uh, properties make your filter the best uh, choice for the stack memory. And this is how we implement it. So in the logic layer, we only need a comparator to compare two bit vector, and then a counter to uh, increase the number of ones. And then if it is more than a threshold or this time, so you just uh, you don't produce it to the core where you do the dynamic programming algorithm. And this is the paper where you can get the source code and you can check and play with the code. Okay, so this is another work called Gen Cache. It's not produced by our group, this is by another group, but presented recently this year in Micro 52. And what they did here, they observed that some of our pre alignment filters that we developed are good at certain read length and certain at distant threshold. So they said, okay, why not to find which one is best for this configuration and which best for other configuration, and then combine many pre-alignment filters together, such that whenever the user said, I want this is the central, this read length, and they said, okay, here's your pre-alignment filter, the best for you, and it will give you the, the result. And the, the second interesting thing they did, they implement all of these pre-alignment filters inside the cache. Not in memory, not in the proxy core. However, this uh, this introduced an overhead to the cache. So they changed the cache such that they require a 16.4 percent increase in the area of the cache. So industry people normally they don't like any overhead to the cache or to the DRAM and so on. But this is very beneficial actually to perform. And these are the, 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 the configuration for each pre aligned filter. So when the distance threshold is zero, they use Hamming distance. When it is one, they use this filter. And when it's two to five, they use another one. When it is six or more, they use another one, and so on. And by implementing just one of these pre aligned filters in cache, they get this much of speed up. And this is the size of the if they increase the size of the cache to this, the speed up of course increases because you can update more data. But by doing many pre-alignment filters integrated together, which they call phasing, then they get this much of speed up. So you can see the benefits of even combining many of these based on different setup. Okay, now the last direction, how they accelerate dynamic programming algorithms. So this is another paper proposed last year, NAS Plus 2018, called Darwin, where they claim speed up of 15,000x compared to long read uh, alignment software. So what they did here is that they accelerated the dynamic programming algorithm, and they did actually really nice analysis of the CPU-based read aligner and hardware accelerated read aligner. So in the report that we need this much of resources to do dynamic programming algorithm on CPU and we need this much, this number of cycles, 37 cycles to complete the computation and we need this much of energy to do this on CPU however in hardware they need way less cycles, energy and resources to perform this operation <coughs> and this is how they accelerate the dynamic programming algorithm using systolic array. However, I'm not really sure how they achieve the acceleration because they split this dynamic programming matrix into tiles or sub-matrices and then process each one individually. So I'm not really sure how accurate this approach because as I told you, there is a, a lot of data to be indexed. You cannot simply chop the dynamic programming table into smaller sub-matrices. For example, think about this row. You really need to compute this cell, the cell before, which is the up and the, the left, and the up left one, right? So you need three cells to compute any cell in the dynamic programming table. So by splitting this, how, how are you going to compute this? Do we have any heuristic to compute the entire row of this sub matrix? I don't know. So this is the setup how they implemented. And they actually implemented a CMOS chip 
they simulated for this uh, nanotechnology or technology known for uh, CMOS process. And they got this much of speed up compared to graph uh, map uh, with the liner. And when they compared to the dynamic programming when they accelerated in CMOS, they got around 5,000 x of speed up. Okay, Darwin is not done by our group. The source code is there, you can have it, you can change it if you like. And, yeah, as I mentioned, Darwin is not part of our group, but we developed something we call BitMac, where we implement the full dynamic programming algorithm inside 3D stacked memory without compromising the accuracy of dynamic programming algorithm. So we are not splitting it, everything is there with full power, and by doing that, we are achieving 2.1x better throughput uh, compared to Darwin and 59 better throughput per unit power when compared to the data programming algorithm of Darwin. Okay, so this is a conclusion on the three key directions that I presented. So read alignment can be substantially accelerated using computationally inexpensive and accurate pre-aligned filtering. And by accuracy, I mean zero false negative, but it's okay to have false positive. And all the three directions are still used by members today, and I suggest anyone of you would like to accelerate the read mapping process should follow the three key directions. But filtering has replaced alignment, as we all agree now, that programming, we cannot do much about it, because it's 100% accurate, and there are a lot of data dependencies, so the best you can do place many cores in 3D stack memory or FPGA or GPU to accelerate for many strings rather than for single uh, string. But what you can do is improve the heuristic that reduce the workload set to the dynamic program algorithm, which we call pre-aligned filtering. And pre-aligned filtering doesn't sacrifice any of the aligner capabilities <coughs> because we don't care about the output result. We are not interpreting the output result in a different way. We still send all the text to the dynamic programming algorithm and whatever you have prepared in dynamic programming algorithm, you don't touch it. It's still there. You maintain the same CGAR string, same alignment uh, score, and all these properties needed. And we are not uh, replacing or modifying the alignment step. So whatever you are using, global, local, semi-global alignment, you are still using that. Okay, so we finished all these points, and now the time to wrap up the things and uh, mention the future opportunities that we have to further develop the things. So now think about this sequencing machine. If one of these companies really happened to get to know how to sequence our genome in a better way, such that we can read the full content of your genome without chopping it into read, what will happen to all the work we presented? What will happen to read mapping a process, for example? Think about it. Will we move all of this work to trash, for example? Do we really need to still do read mapping? If this machine are really able, or smartwatch really able to read your DNA and analyze it. So you need to think twice, actually. Think about metagenomics, band genomics, and all those research field where you're comparing DNA to DNA, not read to DNA. DNA full sequence to full sequence. So I want your sequence to be compared with your sequence, for example. So I'm, I'm, I'm still doing the comparison, right? Even if I get the full sequence. And how I compare it, I don't use Hamming distance. Because I'm still looking for a large portion of insertion, deletion, to look for diseases, or just out of curiosity, right? So to do this insertion, deletion, substitution, verification, I still need the dynamic programming algorithm. And dynamic programming, as we agreed, is very expensive. Think about applying it for a sequence of length 3 billion characters. So you have 3 billion characters here, 3 billion characters here. Then the size of the dynamic programming table is really huge. And think about, you are comparing, for example, a human being to a banana. Right? They are really highly dissimilar. Or virus to a human. Because you don't know metagenomic in your sample, what do you have? So you need to compare it to all the database. Right? So when you compare one by one, you need, you need a heuristic to tell you very fast way 
whether this has exact match or similarity or not before applying the programming algorithm. And this is where our tools can be still used to tell you in this, this database, you really need to compare this genome to all the references you have in the database or not, right? So the read mapping process, although it's coming after the fact that we are not able to read the full content of the genome, but even if we read it, we still need all these things that we develop. And this is the paper I promised in, the early, uh, in, in my talk earlier. So it shows that African people having um, more things to discover rather than the reference that we have in our hand. So that's why we really need a reference for every population, even within the same country, for each city, we need a reference, uh, or for each um, a group of people, we need a reference that represents them a better way. So that's why we still need to sequence more individual, more species, to discover plants, animal, and so on. And for that, we will still be comparing them together. Okay, at the end, did we achieve our goal? Did we get this smartwatch, for example, by doing all this work? So, of course, implementing an FPGA is a proof of concept. It's not the end of the world. So to do that, we will need one of these companies to take the initiative and start building customized chip or board to analyze or do read mapping, read mapping in a very fast way, right? And we still have this open question, how and where to enable fast, not only fast, but also accurate to maintain the correctness of this bioinformatic analysis. And we want to cheap, and cheap here is questionable. We don't know how cheap. It should be $1,000, $100,000. And look at Tesla car, for example. It's $100,000, and normal car around $20,000. But people still buy Tesla, right, if they like. And the same thing for read mapping. You could pay a little more, but you could uh, benefit many more people. For example, about hospital, you, could, you can afford the large cluster of nodes to process their DNA. But you, you'll be serving a lot of people uh, reading their DNA, doing personalized medicine, and so on. And this is still an open question. Should we do it in GPU, FPGA, and 3D stack memory, or move all the computation power to the sequencing machine itself? And this is what we still need to answer correctly. And there's no single correct answer. So the conclusion of this lecture, system design for bioinformatics is still a critical problem and has a large scientific impact, even in the society. And um, we, are, we were discussing here a key step of bioinformatics called genome sequence analysis. But of course, it is not only about genome analysis. There are many other steps involved in bioinformatics that need be to look into it and accelerate it. But this is the most important one because this is one of the earlier steps that you need to perform regardless of the application that you are looking for. And there are many bottlenecks exist in accessing and manipulating a huge amount of genomic data during the analysis. So not you need to accelerate the computation, but you need, really need to handle this huge amount of data. And the best way to do it, in this sequencing machine, they don't generate the data right away, all of it. So you need to wait 44 hours. And within this time, you don't get the full amount of data. What you get is chunk by chunk every couple of minutes. So if you can process these data as they come, chunk by chunk, this is the best way how to handle them, rather than just waiting for 44 hours for a huge amount of data, then process them at once, which they will uh, flood or over flood your uh, memory, your caches, and so on. So we covered various recent ideas to accelerate read mapping, and uh, these ideas were presented uh, since 2006 all the way to now. We have old paper, recent paper, and so on. And all of the, the um, I would like to acknowledge Professor Normoglu, Professor Jana Lacan, who was my PhD advisor, where I did some of this work I presented to in my PhD, and my colleague collaborators, funding agencies, and don't forget, all the work I presented are published online in this link or in each paper link. So please feel free to access it. Maybe collaborate in some of these projects, propose a new algorithm, new method, new indexing structure, for example, and so on. And these are two references for you. Maybe you can get more information about this area. 
these uh, really very useful references I find with myself. And thank you so much. Any other questions? So before, I would like really to know. I have one question. Yes. Okay, so I understand. So, so effectiveness of so the shifting time distance to uh -huh. short wave alignment. So uh -huh. uh, my question is: so the applicability of uh, gatekeeper and shoji to uh, long read, uh, long read. So, but long read has many error. Yes. Well, uh, so yes, that's a very good question. Uh, yes. So we did some analysis in a paper called Magnet. So I have it actually here. I didn't present it. So in this paper we call it Magnet. We did some analysis. Um, maybe we can check the paper reference. Yeah, here. So you can check this paper and you'll see a lot of analysis about the false positive rate of uh, gatekeeper. Mm -hmm. And we notice that beyond the distant threshold of 8, there's no false rate. So it's useless. Don't use it after the distant threshold of 8. But for example, steep snake, we improve the things way better. So you can go to 50, 100, the distant threshold, it's fine. So for that, for uh, long uh, reads, you need an edit distance of more than 15%, uh, for example, of the read length. Mm -hmm. And read length can be 10,000, can be 2 million. Mm -hmm. So 15% of 10, 2 million, for example, is really a huge number. Mm -hmm. So gatekeeper can't handle it. Yeah. It's best for short reads. Mm -hmm. But for sneak snake, you can do that, for example. And we are going on, uh, we are working on new read mapper that uses sneak snake for both short and long. Mm -hmm. But still under the wall. Yeah. And the question?